Today's video is one that I've been looking forward to making for quite a long time. I'm gonna be making a beer here today that nobody can actually fully replicate because of one very special ingredient, yeast. A longtime channel viewer sent me some wild farmhouse ale yeast that he found and cultivated off of some fruit that grew in his backyard. He's been brewing with this yeast for quite a while now, and he actually sent it over to White Labs to get it analyzed. And turns out it is a Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain, which is a standard brewer's yeast, not a Britannomyces wild yeast like you might expect. Not only that, but it's also diastaticus positive, which means it can ferment complex sugars and it has very similar character to a classic Saison strain that you might find in the Wallonia region of Belgium. It's really interesting that this stuff was growing in fruit trees in the woods of Alabama, uh, but hey, here we are. He sent some of that yeast up to me to brew with, as well as some beers that he made using the yeast, and I can confirm that it is absolutely something that tastes very similar to a Saison strain, although quite a bit cleaner than your typical Saison strain. It doesn't throw as many of those complex esters and phenols uh, as a Saison strain does, but it does ferment down bone dry and still has some nice character to it. I'm just really excited to brew with this yeast because there's no other yeast out there like it. Of course, we have commercially available Saison strains out there that have been propagated long and have been you know, commercially used for many, many years, but this strain is one that I'm never gonna find ever again. And this beer that I make is gonna be the only one I ever make that's like it. So it's very special and it's something that I really wanna have a good time with. So because of the nature of this particular strain of yeast, I figured the best beer to make for it would be a classic Belgian style Saison. It's a super refreshing beer because it's extra dry and very highly carbonated, but still lots of good flavor to it. And sometimes a little spice element too, which is really nice. It's perfect for any of the warm months, to be honest with you. And it's something I think is gonna be great to close out summer with. So without further ado, let's jump into what this recipe is gonna look like. Really quickly, just want to give a shout out to a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, who provided all the ingredients, except for the yeast, of course, which you're not going to be able to find anywhere. And uh, Clawhammer Supply, secondly, for the electric brewing system, which I'll be brewing this particular beer on. I'm going to be using their 10 gallon, 240 volt system today. So for the grist on this beer, it's really important we start out with high quality base malt. So we're starting with one of the best Belgian Pilsner malts you can find, which is Franco Belge's Pilsen Malt. Uh, we use an eight pounds of that to make up about 60% of the grist. And then we're gonna follow up with three pounds of pale wheat malt. Um, this is not normally something you'll find in Belgian beers for the most part. Usually they're actually pretty much 100% barley. People do like to add wheat in for various reasons. But for Saison brewing, wheat is actually a pretty common ingredient. In this case, what I'm expecting to get out of the wheat is actually quite a lot of flavor. In my opinion, the wheat flavor is something that really separates Saisons quite a bit from your typical dry fermented Belgian ale. Um, so not only am I gonna get flavor out of this, I'm also gonna get nice residual haze, and I'm going to get spectacular head retention, which is exactly what we want here. This is gonna slightly puff up the body too, it's gonna round things out a little bit, make it slightly softer feeling, um, but hopefully not too soft because we still want this to feel very dry and be very refreshing and drinkable. Next, we're gonna add a pound and a half of Belgian Munich malt, Dingemann's Munich malt to be specific. Um, so Munich malt being a slightly toastier character of a base malt, something that gives a little bit more richness to the malt character, something that gives it depth. Um, as this beer is going to hopefully be extraordinarily dry, this is something that's going to really bring forth a lot of extra flavor to help survive that really low final gravity. And then finally on the grist, a simple sugar addition. In this case, I'm adding one pound of clear candy syrup into uh, the boil at the end of the boil. This effectively has zero impact on the flavor of the beer, but it does increase the alcohol content and it increases the uh, ability for the yeast to ferment the wort further down. You're gonna get a lower final gravity out of this. It's something that just really helps drive that attenuation home. And that's very important for this particular beer. For the hops in this beer, I'm aiming for a medium level of, of bitterness here. This is gonna be a very dry beer if we play our cards correctly. And what that means is that bitterness is gonna go a long way. So we wanna be very careful with the balance of the beer and trying to keep it from being thrown out of balance by adding too much bitterness. The bitterness and the hop character is gonna help accentuate the refreshing character of the beer. 
and it's gonna help it feel sprightly and lively uh, when it's highly carbonated, but we wanna be careful to keep it in check. So I'm aiming for something around 30 IBUs. About half of that is coming from a bittering addition at 60 minutes in the boil of one third of an ounce of Magnum to get us about 15 to 16 IBUs. And then after that, we're gonna add one ounce of Styrian Goldings at 30 minutes, one ounce at 15 minutes, and one ounce at zero minutes to bring us up to about 29 IBUs. Styrian Goldings is a really nice hop for these beers. It's really herbal and spicy. And what it does is it kind of gives a little bit of like a coriander flavor to the beer I've found. Um, as well as like a little bit of a pepper note. It's refreshing, it's welcome, it's nice in saisons and it shines when the beer is dry. So I think that's gonna be the perfect hop for this style. Um, you could substitute with Saz perhaps if you wanted to because that has very similar characteristics. For the water profile on this beer, I built one that's actually got quite a few minerals in it because I wanna add a little bit of an edge to the mouthfeel. But chiefly the most important thing is that I'm increasing the sulfate to chloride ratio. I'm aiming for something about 1.7, 1.8 to one uh, to get the effect of increasing the dry feeling of the beer. I, if it's not obvious by the amount of times that I've mentioned this already in this video, Saisons have to be dry. The final gravity ideally should be less than 10.05 uh, at the end of the day. The dryness of the beer is kind of like the defining characteristic of the style. Um, you definitely have an increased level of dryness relative to other Belgian ales, and that's what makes it refreshing. It's what makes it thirst quenching. Um, originally, these beers were made to be uh, basically thirst quenchers for the farmers in the fields of the Wallonia region of Belgium, which is still to this day very rural. Because they were using the wild yeast in the region, which was diastatic as positive, you were getting so much dryness out of them. And that's what carried on throughout the years to keep the style the way it is. With the water profile capitalizing on that drying effect, it really just drives it home that it should be dry and refreshing and it should feel like you're drinking champagne almost in the level of dryness that we're asking for here. So the water profile I'm getting is 99 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 34 parts per million of sodium, 108 parts per million of chloride, 187 parts per million of sulfate, and 16 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I am starting out with reverse osmosis water, which has trace amounts of those minerals in it already. Uh, but I'm adding to about eight gallons of that reverse osmosis water, four grams of calcium chloride, two grams of sodium chloride, three grams of Epsom salts, and eight grams of gypsum salts. For the yeast in this beer, this is the special ingredient here. You're not gonna be able to find the random wild yeast that my buddy cultivated off of fruit from his backyard in Alabama but you can use, I would recommend, a Belgian-style Saison yeast. The best recommendations I have for you are Y3726 Farmhouse Ale or Y3724 Belgian Saison. These are the Brasserie de Blaugie and the Brasserie du Pont strains, respectively, and the latter is available through many other different manufacturers as their typical, like, Belgian Saison kind of strain. These are great for fermenting Saisons. They'll get super dry, and they will kick out lots of esters and phenols to create lots of great flavor. This particular farmhouse ale strain I'm gonna be using here is gonna give me similar character, but it's probably not going to be nearly as expressive as those Belgian strains that I mentioned. So just keep that in mind when you're designing your recipe. If you're so inclined, you could add spices to this beer as well. Although it's typically not done in most Belgian ales, it's not that uncommon for Saisons to be spiced. There are spiced ones and there are non-spiced ones. The uh, non-spiced ones are certainly more common, but if you want to add a little bit of extra character to the beer, orange, coriander, variations of pepper, those spices kind of really are what you would be looking for. I just would highly recommend that if you are going to be using spices in a particular beer like this, use a very, very light hand. Only a few grams of each spice is all you need for an entire five gallon batch. So just don't go crazy with them, you will regret that. Lastly, for the mash in this beer, I'm gonna be mashing this one with a step mash. You don't have to do this. If you don't have the ability to do a step mash, totally fine. These beers can be made with a single infusion rest, a single rest at about 146 degrees Fahrenheit or 63 degrees Celsius. This is a nice low temperature. Hold that mash rest as long as you feel comfortable that you're gonna get complete conversion. I would recommend 60 minute mash rest. You can probably get away with less, but you'll get incomplete conversion and could have a less fermentable wort. The 
idea here is you have as fermentable of a wort as possible. So getting all of the conversion that could take place with a beta amylase enzyme, getting you these short chain sugars that are super fermentable and getting your final gravity all the way down to where it needs to be. In my case, I'll be doing my typical two-step mash, about 148 degrees Fahrenheit for about 45 minutes and then 158 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, followed up by a mash out at 170 for 15 minutes. Not a necessary thing to do, but it's just my habits. I'm excited to get this beer going. It should be ready relatively quickly, um, depending on how long the diastaticus takes to do its thing. But from what my friend has told me, it doesn't take very long at all. Anyway, guys, let's get brewing. I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water to my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat it up to the temperature of the first mash rest. As everything was heating up, I milled out my grain. I also measured out the water salts and added those into the strike water as it was heating up. Once I reached the target mash rest temperature for the first step of 148 Fahrenheit, I dowed in with the entire grain bill, stirring it up thoroughly, making sure to distribute it evenly and avoiding any dough clumps. I let the mash recirculate for about 10 minutes before pulling a sample for a pH measurement to confirm the mash pH. Uh, measured at 5.1 uh, at a hot temperature, which really actually translates to more like 5.3, 5.4, which is exactly on target. So I did nothing to adjust for the pH levels in the mash and left it as it was. I let the mash continue at 148 Fahrenheit for another 45 minutes, and then I stepped it up to the next step of 158 Fahrenheit and let it rest there for 30 minutes. Finally, stepping up to 170 Fahrenheit for 15 minutes. Once everything was complete with the mash, I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain over the kettle for about 15 minutes while I heated the kettle up towards the boil. Once about 15 minutes of draining had taken place, I removed the grain basket and carried on fully towards a boil. At the 60 minute mark at the top of the boil, I started out by adding my bittering addition, which was one third of an ounce of Magnum hops, allowed those to sit and boil in the wort for 30 minutes before adding any more hops. At the 30 minute mark, I added one ounce of Styrian Goldings, let the boil continue for 15 more minutes, then added one more ounce of Styrian Goldings at the 15 minute mark. Let the boil continue for five more minutes, and then I added in Whirlflock and Yeast Nutrient. As well as the one pound of clear candy syrup. And let the boil continue for 10 more minutes before the end of the boil was reached, and at the zero minute mark, I added in my final ounce of Styrian Goldings. I conducted a quick whirlpool to make all the trube and hop debris pile up in the center of the kettle before transferring. I chilled and transferred through my counterflow chiller into my anvil bucket fermenter. Haven't used that in a little while, so it was nice to break that out. I then put it in my fermentation chamber to get it cooled down further to the pitching temperature target of 65 degrees. Once the entire batch had finally chilled down to my target pitch temperature, I pitched in my starter made from the Alabama farmhouse yeast and recorded an OG measurement of 1064, which was four points below target, but not to worry, this beer is really gonna attenuate out really far, so OG isn't really all that important. At this point, I made the spur of the moment decision to open ferment this beer for the first few days, so I actually just added a dry airlock and left it to ferment. All right, so now let's talk about the fermentation plan for this beer. Uh, so for this particular yeast, the wild yeast that I'm using, the guidance I was given was fermented anywhere between 65 and 75 degrees. That's where it likes it the most and seems to be giving the best flavors. So that's what I'll be doing. Because I wanna drive attenuation home, I'm gonna pitch this one at 65 degrees at the, at the bottom of the temperature spectrum for the particular yeast. Once it gets started, I'm gonna ramp up the fermentation temperature by one degree per day. So that'll get us another 10 days of fermentation until we're at 75 degrees. I will hold it at 75 degrees until it completes fermentation. And then once I'm satisfied, when I have a stable final gravity, transfer it into a keg, get it carbonated and ready to serve. Now, because pretty much everybody watching my video is not gonna have access to this yeast, We'll talk more about what is a good substitute. In the Saison world, there's many different yeasts you can use to uh, ferment these types of beer. There's Belgian Saison yeast, there's French Saison yeast, there's wild farmhouse yeast, and there's also just various other variations on farmhousey type of yeasts. Or you could even use lacto and sour the beer, and really you can use any yeast you want to make these beers. Uh, and if you want to stay true to style, I would really recommend in this particular style using either the French Saison yeast or the Belgian Saison yeast. 
French Saisons, available as YEs 3711 or White Labs WLP 590. It's also available from Imperial Yeast as Imperial Napoleon. Omega also makes OIL 026 as a French Saison. The rule of thumb for French Saison, it's gonna attenuate like a monster and it's gonna throw a lot more phenolic character than estuary character. What that means is a little bit more spicy flavors as opposed to fruity flavors. Overall though, French Saison is an incredibly reliable yeast and will get the job done pretty much every single time. Keep in mind though, if you're pitching a French Saison yeast, it is known as a killer strain, and what that means is that if you're co-pitching another yeast for any reason uh, with that French Saison yeast, the French Saison will ac actually like go kill off the other strain of yeast and dominate the fermentation in general. So if you're co-pitching with French Saison, don't because it won't work. As far as the Belgian Saison strains go, I can highly recommend YE's 3724 and 3726. There's also White Labs WLP 565 and 568, and Omega sells OYL 042 as well, which is a great Belgian Saison strain. Belgian Saison is available as Rustic from Imperial Yeast as well. The thing about Belgian Saison yeast that makes it different from French Saison yeast is it's way more expressive. You get more quantity in general of both esters, which are your fruity flavors, and phenols, which are your spicy flavors, and just more of it overall in general. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes they can stall in the middle of the fermentation. What that means is they'll ferment for quite a while until they get about halfway complete and then it'll stop. It'll just drop out, do nothing for a really long time. And then all of a sudden it'll magically start up again. Um, and it's really frustrating as a home brewer to have stuck fermentation like that. That being said, it's never happened to me. And in all cases, I think it's because I'm taking good care of my yeast and my wort. So as long as you're not abusing this yeast, you should probably see more often than not a standard fermentation take place. If the Saison yeast stalls out on you for some reason though, I would recommend increasing the fermentation temperature all the way up to at most about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And if that's not working, add in, in some yeast nutrient of the appropriate type or some yeast vitalizer can help out with that process as well. And lastly, of course, there's the option to use non-Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeasts in this particular beer. I've actually made two saisons using Britannomyces wild yeast. One was a 100% Brett saison, the other was a co-pitch with a sac strain, and they both turned out awesome. Brett yeasts are really fun. They're not as popular nowadays as they used to be, but they kick out these really exciting flavors like pineapple and stone fruit, but they're also effectively very distinct in their flavors of like kind of barnyard funky horse kind of character. That's the way it's described most of the time. It's, it's a very particular flavor and you will notice it once you understand what it is. Brett beers are pretty fun to make, but they take a lot of planning. So just be careful if you're gonna try going down that road. You could also use a relatively popular farmhouse ale uh, series of yeasts that hails from Scandinavia called Kvike. In this particular instance though, instead of using your typical Hornendal or Voss Kvikes, I'd actually recommend using Juvaru, which is a really interesting Lithuanian farmhouse Kvike that was isolated from a very particular home brewer. The fun thing about Saison is that you could do almost whatever you want with this beer style. It's wide open in terms of style. They can be light, they can be dark, they can be strong, they can be session beers, they can be hazy, they can be clear. Like there's a million different things you can do with them. And it really is a great opportunity to showcase your creativity as a home brewer. So yeah, have fun with it, enjoy it, do whatever you want with this particular beer. But what I've given you here, minus the yeast, is a classic Belgian Saison setup. So it should be a good base for you to experiment around with whatever yeast you choose to use. And I hope you do experiment with it because it's the best way to learn. Anyway guys, just to summarize what I'll be doing, I'll be pitching my Alabama farmhouse ale yeast into the wort at about 65 degrees, letting fermentation get started and then ramping up the temperature of the fermentation by one degree per day every single day until I reach 75 degrees at which point I will hold the temperature of the fermentation there until the fermentation is completely finished and I see an adequately dry final gravity. At that point, if the beer is tasting good and it's actually finished the fermentation, I'll transfer into my keg and get that carbonated up and ready to serve. Should be a great time and I'm really excited to share this with you and see what comes of this particular yeast. And until then, cheers. 
fermentation for this beer was actually a lot faster than I anticipated. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the first three days were done as an open ferment with a dry airlock. However, once I saw that the Krausen was starting to fall and the uh, CO2 production was starting to decrease, I swapped out the dry airlock with a full airlock to allow uh, for the CO2 to be captured and to uh, ward off any oxidation concerns. Because of the diastaticus on this beer, I did leave it a lot longer to condition uh, and really just dry itself out, but I saw my final gravity of 1003 within the first 10 days, and I'm quite happy with that level of attenuation at 96%. Shortly thereafter, I kegged the beer and then force carbonated to a higher than standard level of carbonation uh, so that we can really get the most out of this effervescence beer. The beer is called Jean Beljean, and it comes in at 8% ABV and 29 IBUs. I had to pour this one very slowly using my flow restrictor taps because of the high carbonation level, but it does a pretty good job of keeping the carbonation in and it is worth the extra time it takes to pour. For the appearance of the beer, it is pouring a hazy golden color. Uh, it does look very similar to a Hefeweizen in, in the character of the haze and in the color as well. The head on the beer is absolutely spectacular, as I was hoping. It pours with a whipped cream-like consistency. The color of the head is actually a little bit off-white, which is kind of surprising. I was actually expecting it to be more stark white, um, but maybe the Munich malt colored it a bit. Either way, it has a really wonderful consistency that is somewhere between latte foam and whipped cream. It's, it's awesome. All right, so now let's go in for aroma. On the aroma, I think I'm getting a sweet malt character. I'm definitely getting a little bit of like a bubblegum spice note. I think I'm definitely getting some hops on the aroma as well. It's nice overall, it's refreshing smelling. A little bit of like a, a citrus note as well, I think. Yeah, it's going for mouthfeel next. Mouthfeel on this one is really nice. It's exactly what I was hoping for. Actually, it's better than I was hoping for. Not only is it very dry, you get that feeling of dryness. It, it's very highly carbonated as well. It gives it that really nice spritz and life and sparkling character. Um, that really brings it to life. It accentuates the dryness. Uh, but still, there's a neat texture element there from the high amount of wheat malt that I added. It's like soft and fluffy feeling in a way, but still remains dry. Um, I don't quite know how to describe it, but it's extremely satisfying. It really just hits the spot, quenches the thirst without being excessive. Um, and that dryness really does make you kind of want to go in for another sip because the flavor doesn't linger that long. And actually now let's talk about that flavor. This is awesome. I really love what came out of it because the yeast character that's in here is super unique. Um, although not unfamiliar, to be honest. It's really interesting. So, first and foremost, there's a really delicious malt flavor on this. So just a really, really nice white bready character that's got a little bit of depth to it, a little bit of richness to it, but not too much because it fades relatively quickly. You get that nice cereally wheat character that's so delicious in a beer like this. And then there's just loads of spiciness. I definitely get the Styrian Goldings in like quantity in this beer. I mean, it's awesome. They're like super herbal spicy. They really come out a lot more when they're not obstructed by heavy amounts of malt and yeast character. It's like coriander with a hint of grassiness to it, with a hint of earthiness to it. It really suits this beer very, very well. I would not have changed that hop at all. And then the yeast character that's coming through is really fun. It's got absolutely classic Saison characters to it. It's got the little bit of bubblegum flavor up front, and then it has this really zesty citrus character, some nice orange and lemon uh, coming through, and then an herbaceous, just delicious bouquet of 
spicy phenolic type flavors that I really enjoy and really goes well with the style. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's certainly a case where you could add some spices into this beer, typically like your orange and coriander, but you don't need to. And the reason why is because a lot of these flavors, these desirable characteristics of these beers really do come from the hops and the yeast. And that's exactly what's going on here because I get orange and coriander for days without having put either ingredient into the beer. There's also like a little bit of a white pepper, um, just a little spice uh, in there, that a little zestiness. Of course, uh, this attenuated pretty far down, so we're looking at like an 8% beer. It really did turn out pretty drinkable for that level of alcohol. It is definitely a beer that I would consider to be dangerous. Um, it is very drinkable, very refreshing, very flavorful, but not heavy. And uh, <laughs> it'll catch up to you if you're not careful. Now that it's warming up again, I'm getting a very much Belgian triple like honey character. Um, feel like orange blossom honey is the typical descriptor I use for that. It is absolutely fantastic. It's just a really nice, satisfying end of summer beer for me. I, we're kind of getting down to the tail months of the season and um, this is just a really nice way to kind of put a bow on everything for summer beers. I'm happy with it. I, I really can't find very much I'd want to change about it. The only complaint I have is that it's got some, probably more haze to it than I expected it would have, but like a Hefeweizen, I think if I leave it on long enough, it'll probably start to drop out. Ingredient wise, recipe wise though, I don't think there's much I would change, if anything at all. And I love the way that the yeast worked with this. I would be very interested to see what would happen if uh, I did swap it for a typical classic Belgian Saison yeast, the Yeast 3724, the Yeast 3726, Bell Saison, French Saison, like there's so many things you can do with it. And each one of those yeasts is gonna have a wildly different impact on the actual flavor of the beer, but that's why it's special. This, this one's never gonna get made again. So it's, it's really interesting to kind of really dig into those flavors and find out what's actually responsible for them. This is a beer I'm gonna remember very fondly, that's for sure. I'm gonna try and make it last though this time. To that awesome fan who sent over the yeast to me, thank you very much for sharing it. Um, this is an awesome, awesome uh, strain and I am very satisfied with the results that it came. You've got a great yeast growing in your backyard. But to the rest of you guys, thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed this, found it useful. Uh, and if you did, please go ahead, hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below with your thoughts and everything. Let me know what you thought about this whole experience and the beer and the yeast and yeah, whatever else strikes your fancy. I enjoy talking to you guys and I enjoy reading those comments. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this design and plenty of others in the merchandise store, which is linked down in the description box. I also have a Patreon, and my patrons are really the reason why this channel has grown so much in production value over the last several years. Honestly, I could not continue doing this uh, as much as I have been and keep it up for as long as I have been without the support of the patrons. So your generosity is really, really appreciated, and it goes a very, very long way. So big thank you to you guys for helping keep this channel going. If Patreon is not your thing though, there's other ways to help support me. Um, I have channel memberships. There's also the super thanks button. You can hit either of those things if you uh, wanna quickly help support the channel. I also have an Amazon store, which is linked in the description box as well with a lot of the uh, standard brewing equipment that I use on the regular. Also my channel production equipment's on that list. So feel free to check it all out if you're curious. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Apartment Brewer. So go check those links out for some more frequent content updates and you'll get to see what's gonna come to YouTube in the very near future or the distant future in some cases like that one beer that I've got going. <laughs> anyway, guys, if you are still here, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means the world to me that you're watching the whole thing. I put a ton of work into these and I really do hope that they're helping people out. So if you're watching the whole thing, it probably means you're either very entertained or you really wanna learn everything you can. Either way, it means a lot to me that you're still here. And so this one goes out to you. And until the next one, happy brewing and cheers. That was a good beer. Mm.